Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. Well, to kind of piggyback off of what uh, Jerry said, um, one of the coolest things I've done in Philly was I returned home. <laughs> so to me, that was pretty cool. You know, just coming back and um, thank you. All right. <laughs> Returning home and, and being gone for so long, almost a decade, you realize how cool your city is when you come back. So now I'm revisiting everything I didn't pay too much attention to prior to my incarceration. I'm going to Liberty Bell. I'm doing all these things that I never paid no attention to prior to. So that was pretty cool. So today I'm going to tell you a story about how my story is a little different than your typical stories as far as upbringing and having, you know, coming from an impoverished area. I was actually... We were from North Philadelphia originally, and I moved to the Northeast fairly young. And I come from a loving family. My family of two parents in a home, siblings, everything was uh, pretty cool for the most part. We had issues, of course, but for the most part, our family was pretty tight. And they supported me throughout a lot of the, the things that I've been through. During that time period, growing up, I always had a, I always thought I was the master of the Jedi growing up. I always thought that I had all the answers. I, I was going to do it the way I was going to do it. Nobody's going to tell me what not to do. And ultimately, <laughs> it kind of got me in trouble. So since that time, growing up, I, I started realizing that school wasn't for me. I was, I was a little different in, in comparison to my sisters because they were college grads. My, me and my brother were kind of the same. We wanted to do it our way, and we kind of were hard-headed that way, and we both actually were in some trouble. 21, I had my first daughter. She was, um, she was born in 1998, and we uh, ended up moving in my wife, apartment together. We wanted to do some things as far as, well, she wanted to go to school. I wasn't going to school, but I was working at the time. So what I wanted to do is I said, okay, well, you concentrate on school. Do the things that you need to do. I'll pay for the rest. I'll take care of the bills. I'll make sure the house is taken care of so she can pursue her career as a nurse. She was a registered nurse. We wanted to be a registered nurse. During that time period, I wanted to start my own business because I had an interest in real estate. I always had an interest since I was young, fixing up houses, buying houses, doing that things, those type of things. So during that period, I said, okay, well, me being the master of the Jedi, right? I said, well, I'm going to come up with a way I could do, I can go to work, take care of everything I need to take care of, have her still continue to go to full-time school and start my real estate company. Now, growing up, I always had a lot of friends who were doing selling drugs, doing things that they had no business doing, just coming around with piles of money all the time. But initially, I didn't, I didn't, get, I didn't fall into none of that. I was like, no, nah, I'm going to do it the right way. I'm going to go to you know, work, work overtime, 60-hour weeks. Until I kept going to banks and getting denied, denied. I didn't know too much about credit at that time. I'm only 20, 21 years old. So I'm, I'm not understanding. I'm saying, OK, well, I don't have any credit, so what's the issue? But again, me being a little narrow-minded and not really studying, I started to find out why bad credit. It's just, no credit is just as bad as bad credit. So during that time period, um, again, my friends coming around, they saying, listen, man, you're working all this time, doing all this. You can come here with me. We can make the money that you're making a week there, you can do it in a couple hours. You can start your real estate company. You can take care of everything. That you, all the goals you set for yourself, you can do it in half the time. So eventually, again, I still kind of resisted initially for a few months, months, kept saying, no, I'm a grind, I'm a grind, I'm a grind, until I just kept getting denied and denied, and it was just getting harder, and then I had my second child, and I'm saying, okay, this is not going to work. So I fell victim to the temptation of the, the quick money, bottom line. During that time, it was rough, you know, so I just decided to do it. Going through that decision, doing everything that I was doing as far as selling drugs, everything was going well initially. For a little while, I was okay. I was able to do the things I need to do, take care of all the bills, and continue to try to fund my company. And so, everything changed on a fateful day in 2005 when I was called to answer for the, some of the decisions that I made prior to. I was uh, locked up, arrested, and my actually my wife was still pregnant with my son at the time. She wasn't. She didn't conceive yet, and they kicked my door and locked this locked me up. I had a $1.5 million bill. And for the life of me, I couldn't understand why do I have a $1.5 million bill? I have no prior convictions, no anything. But as time goes on, I'll get to know why all these things happen. So I go, I get a paid lawyer, I try to fight the case, go on the trial. Then I realized I was introduced to 
mandatory minimums in, in a federal prison and federal uh, guidelines. It doesn't matter if you have no priors. It doesn't matter if you have any of these situations going on. It's, this, is with the, this is with the time that you're mandatory that you're going to do. So during that time period, I'm saying, okay, well, I got to pay a lawyer. I'll just, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to go to trial because if I go to trial, my counsel, legal counsel told me that I would get 15 years just for making them work. So I said, okay, well, the mandatory minimum for my charge was 10 years. So I get incarcerated. I, I plead guilty. I go in in 2009. That was probably the hardest part or portion of my life. I've never been through anything like that before. Never being incarcerated, being away from my children. I, again, I was with them since we were, I mean, the whole time, you know, being a family-oriented person. It was rough. It was really rough not only for me but for my mother and father. My mother and father was, you know, they tried to raise me with, you know, instill in me that you, you have to answer for your, your, your consequences or your, your choices. And if you don't, you have to pay the consequences. And whatever that is, you have to accept it. And I did that. I accept my responsibility in a role, and I took the time. But my mom was embarrassed, hurt. She didn't understand why I chose to do these things. She couldn't understand why. And now they have to be subject to come three hours out of Philadelphia to visit me, bring my children, bring my wife. Now the house that I did own, mortgage is getting backed up. Everything's starting to change. During that time, she's praying and praying and praying that something will change. Hopefully something will change. Nothing changed. It's just, it was just a really, really tough time for me. It's hard even talking to you guys right now about it because I'm reliving it in my head, but I'm trying to relay the message to you so you can understand the pain, regardless of the fact that I knew I made the choice, I accepted that, it still hurt, period. So that was in 2009, 2011. That's the picture of me in right before, uh, actually that's my second visit, and you can see it in my face, there's no Emotion. It's just like, yeah, I'm here, but if my kids want to take a picture, so I'm going to take a picture. She, my, my son was uh, three at the time. After that, my daughter was 10. So in 2011, the Philadelphia Daily News featured me in a story. Well, actually, before we get to that, I want to uh, talk to you. I want to give you a brief description of what, and how mandatory minimums work in the federal prison. So I want to show a quick two-minute video, if you guys don't mind. Why does the U.S. jail more people than any other country? One reason, mandatory minimums. These were introduced in the 1980s and apply to low-level crimes. Mandatory minimums mean convicted people have to serve a minimum sentence, whether or not a judge thinks they deserve it. For example, drug crimes involving crack, heroin, or marijuana trigger minimum sentences. So do crimes involving firearms, pornography, and immigration. But opponents say the punishment doesn't always fit the crime. Take the story of Kemba Smith, an unemployed woman who moved in with her drug dealer boyfriend. After he was murdered, she was charged with conspiracy to traffic all the drugs he left behind. Mandatory minimum sentence, 24 years. In another case, John Horner, a 46-year-old fast food worker with prescription painkillers, met a friend who wanted some of his pills. The friend turned out to be an undercover agent. Conviction for drug trafficking, 25-year minimum. At 25, Timothy Tyler got caught selling LSD with his dad. Because he had been caught selling twice before, the mandatory sentence, life. Since mandatory minimums were imposed, there has been a 500% increase in the incarcerated population at a cost of $80 billion to run the prison system. Is it time for mandatory minimums to end? So this is quick, that was just a quick explanation of how mandatory minimums work. In my situation, how, they, how the federal government works and, and calculate their time is they'll give you, it's, it's a, guide, a sentencing guideline. And that sentencing guideline is, it goes by your category, which would be one for me because I didn't have any criminal history, and a level, which is numbers, which is 23 at the time. So a category one, level 23, you go on the, on the chart, it's the actual chart, and it, you go across and it gives you the time. The federal government gives you your time in months. So my time at the time was 47 to 57 months, four to five years for my situation. Because of the mandatory minimum, I got double that. I got 10 years. 
So it didn't matter what I did, nothing I could do at that, at that point to get under the 10-year mandatory minimum. And was told also, as I said earlier, if I go to trial for making the, US, the assistant U.S. attorney work, he's going to give me 15 years. So of course, I'm not going to take 15 years. I'm not going to shoot the you know, roll the dice and try to get 15, so I'll just plead guilty to the 10. And of course, I was guilty for possession of the drugs. But what I wasn't or didn't feel I was guilty of was the additional five years that runs consecutive to any other charge for a gun that I was licensed to carry and permitted in the, in the state of Pennsylvania that had nothing to do with the case. It was just sitting in the closet. And when they kicked my door and they actually asked my wife at the time, she said, the, the, uh, the detective said, do you have any legal weapons or weapons, period, in the house? She said, yes, yeah. you get the gun, give him the gun, all the paperwork. I got an additional five years for that. So when you have to take all that in and you realize there's nothing that you can do, that that's it, it's 10 years or, or worse, because it's actually 10 to life. Anytime, anywhere in between there, the judge can give you that because of the mandatory minimum. So you can understand why that first couple years was, was really hard to try to swallow all of that time when I felt that I didn't deserve as much time. So after uh, that time period goes by, 2011, the Philadelphia Daily News features me in an article talking about mandatory minimums and how it's leading a surge in the federal inmates. And they used my case as an example, discussing all the things I just talked to you about. Legal gun, no priors, should have only got four to five years, but instead he's got 10. So now, Mass incarceration, you go from the time mandatory minimum started up until now, we're the most um, incarcerated country. So at the time, I was feeling pretty good about it because during this, this time period, there was nobody talking about it. So now they're using my case. I say, okay, wow, well, now we can get some traction. And this time, I still had six years and some change left. So I'm like, well, something's got to happen in six years. If we're starting a conversation now. And if you look in here, too, also, it states that there was a survey by a commission of 639 federal judges found that 62% of them felt mandatory minimum sentences were too high. So I'm saying, okay, well, man, I'm gonna get out of here early. The judges are already siding with me. The judges are saying that it's too high because you know, their hands are tied. Mandatory minimum is nothing they could do. So at that point, I'm, I'm, I'm real optimistic. I'm, I'm saying, okay, well, you know what? Now I'm gonna, not now, I was always working on coming home, but I was really motivated then because hey, somebody's going to make a change, right? Somebody, some lawmaker's going to say, this is too much. We've got to change this. But instead, a friend of mine comes up to me. Now, again, I'm on my high now. He comes up to me. He says, hey, Derek, you're on the paper again. I go, really? He goes, yeah, look, the comment section. Mm -hmm. He hands me the comment section, and this is what I read. Basically, this gentleman here says that I'm, I'm just, I'm basically a drug dealer. I will never be anything. I'm not a good husband. I'm not a good father. And mandatory minimums should be looked at, but only looked at from the, the people from who the drugs they were using and how they impacted their family. Everybody's entitled to their opinion, right? No issues with that. But what hit me the hardest was, if this is what this man is thinking about, what about all the lawmakers? What if they're feeling the same way? So now I went from here to here. Now I'm not so optimistic about getting out. Now I don't feel so great about coming home or getting out of there early to be with my children and, and try to be the best version of myself at that point. That, so that, light, that night was a real sleepless night, just thinking about how this is going to affect me moving forward. But then something happened after that that morning. I woke up and I said to myself that I'm not gonna let this defeat me. Despite what this man thinks or what anybody else thinks. I know I'm not just a drug dealer. Yes, I've made some bad choices and I'm serving my time for it, I owned it. But that's just, that doesn't define who I am moving forward. So at that point I'm starting now, I'm reaching out to whoever I could to send in books, I'm trying to study, I'm learning stocks, finance, I'm pretty much doing anything possible more real estate classes to build a business plan. So when I came home, I'm hitting the ground running. So for that next, that whole six years, that's basically how I spent my time. On the compound, in the library, learning everything that I could possibly learn to equip myself to be successful when I came home.
and I'm home. June, June 13th to be exact. June 13th, 2017, I'm home. I'm in the halfway house, but I want to briefly, before I go into to what I'm doing here, I want to talk about the halfway house, and I want to talk about how if you don't have a great support system, the halfway house is going to send you back to jail. First of all, I come in first day, you have orientation, you sit down with your case managers and you speak about, they're speaking to you about what they expect of you and what they want you to do within the time period that you're there. Cool. Get a job, do these things, do whatever you need to do to prepare yourself to be successful. Okay, get a job. Most of y'all know y'all been out here. Most jobs are online, right? Everything is through online. Everything is through emails, monster.com, Indeed. I mean, the list goes on. And then they say, okay, now after all of that, you can't have a smartphone. Everything's online. So you're telling me I have to go get what we call the Obama phone? <laughs> I said, first of all, where do you buy that at? <laughs> That's first of all. Second of all, uh, secondly, I should say, I only have, they only let you out for four hours to get a, what's called a hygiene run. So now I'm not worried about hygiene. I'm trying to get a phone because I need that. Long story short, I get one. Of course, I'm not getting anything done with it because I can't get emails. Then you're telling me I have to go to the library. Okay, I go to the library. I fill out these applications online, but I go back to the halfway house. How am I going to check my emails? So now I'm getting, when I finally do get back to the library, I have five or six emails, some of them in which the time then lapsed where I can't apply anymore. How is this helping me back out here? So I did what most of the guys were doing in the halfway house, what they were saying, sneak in a smartphone. So now all the, I've only been home a month and I'm already doing something I ain't got no business doing. But to try to help, not trying to hurt myself, but to try to help. But one good, one good thing happened to me in the halfway house well, one, being home, again, I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact I'm home. Let me get that straight. But the second thing is, there was a bulletin board, and on the bulletin board, there was a, a nonprofit called CTS, Connections Training Services. And during that time, you wanted to get out the halfway house, you had to go to get some education or get a good job. So I said, okay, they're teaching life skills. I'm still trying to be the best version of me, right? So I apply. I get in there. Everything is great. Learning some life skills, getting some plumbing uh, training. But then I ran into a, a nonprofit called Men's Fit. Men's Fit is a nonprofit who, which helps returning citizens coming home with interview clothing and financial literacy services. So now I go there, I'm getting clothes, I got everything going. Now she's asking me, hey, well, you seem like you're pretty you know, polished and, for being gone so long. Would you like to speak at some of the events? Would you like to volunteer? So now I'm volunteering, now I'm doing these things. This is at Eastern State Penitentiary where I'm speaking at, there's a, I think it's called Starlight or Spotlight. Uh, event and now I'm seeing a whole new world because yeah it's my situation I've, I, 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 was a, I was wrong I did everything I, I was supposed to do I came out I tried to you know re, to reacclimate and do everything I need to do but I'm also helping which was cool which is really good so now I'm volunteering for them and FAM which is an organization called Families Against Mandatory Minimums FAM.org which is a phenomenal uh, organization as well. And through those organizations, I've learned that to pay it forward. So during this time while I'm volunteering and, and for FAM and men's, fit, and men's Fit, I run into, I was introduced to a, a young lady named Celeste Trusty, who's a, she's actually the, uh, the state policy director at FAM. And she says, listen, I see that you record all of your uh, speaking engagements and stuff. I see that you're about documenting everything that you're doing. I said, I am. She goes, well, I got a good thing for you. It's a um, criminal justice fellowship that I think you should apply for. I said, oh, really? She said, yeah. So I applied. Once I applied, I was accepted. So in April of, of 2019, I was, I was a, one of the Philadelphia's uh, criminal justice journalists. Now I'm learning about solutions. Instead of just constantly saying what the issue is and, and how it's bad, well, how do we come up with solutions for it? I'm learning it now. And through this fellowship, I ran into Jean, who's at Resolve Philadelphia. She's a founder of, of, of the nonprofit Resolve Philadelphia. She was one of the um, spokesmen to come out to do the event. And she started talking more about solutions journalism. And I said, now, that's what I want to do. I want to learn more about solutions. I want to learn how to get people to come together to talk about solutions, not just the problem. 
So I seen that they were hiring. Now, I have very, very limited experience, of course. I've been going all this time. I might only have, at that time, maybe two months, maybe. So I applied, threw my name in the hat, and I got it. So the crazy part about that was now, now am I, not only am I becoming a part of the solution by helping come up with solutions, <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm getting a, a paycheck for it, and a decent one at that. So that was very, very like, uplifting for me. And being a community engagement editor now is bridging the gap between the communities and the reporters, trying to get them to report more accurate and in detailed stories about the, the neighborhoods that they report on. That's what's all Philly. And Broke in Philly is the initiative of that. And what that does is it's, a, it's actually 24 local news organizations now that provide in-depth, nuanced, and solutions-oriented reporting on issues of poverty that push the economic justice in Philadelphia. For me, that was probably the biggest, most memorable moment other than, of course, me coming home and being able to be a part of this. Because now, when you see that, I carry this, this is the comment section that I've posted on the, on the big side. And I carry this for me from, since 2011 to, to constantly remind myself of what I've been through and never forget. But in addition to what's in my wallet now is my Resolve Philadelphia uh, card saying, Derek Kane, Community Engagement Editor, Resolve Philadelphia. Thank you. <laughs>